Art finds himself dumbfounded in the presence of a deity. After all, the person before him is someone even more powerful than a white core mage. He tries to compose himself before speaking. Before they get to the main reason for their meeting, Art tells Winsome that he would like to confirm a few things first. He wants to know why he was told to enter the teleportation gate leading to Eleanor. He is worried that it might have something to do with Tessia and Virian. However, Winsome reveals that it was his way of tricking him to ensure that he would enter the teleportation gate. To alleviate Art's worries, he uses his magic to conjure a projection of Tessia and Virian. This way Art is able to see with his own eyes that they are perfectly fine and healthy. Winsome adds that Tessia is better than before because of the elixir pearl that Art gave her. This kept her monocore from exploding. He is left completely shocked upon learning that her monocore would have blown up had it not been for the orb that he gave her. With that out of the way, Winsome gets down to the reason why he called him here. Art is a citizen of Decathan, but it's no longer a secret that there are more continents on this planet. This new continent is called Alacria. Both Decathan and Alacria have always been governed by the deities. They reside in the land of Ethiotis. Though the lesser races have regarded them as deities, they have always called themselves of Suras. They are the same beings that passed down the artifacts that allowed the three races to learn magic. Winsome reveals that although Art is informed about the artifacts through Varian, the truth about the Ushuras is something that no one knows. The Ushuras have always been governed by what Winsome refers to as a noblesse oblige. They were never to interfere with any matter regarding the people unless the peace or balance was threatened. However, this imperative rule has now been broken. Atheotis was once divided into three factions made of multiple clans of different races. Each faction had a ruling clan with its own priorities. However, no one ever broke the rule about not interfering with the lesser races. However, this all changed when Agrona became the new leader of the Virtue clan. He broke this rule in an attempt to advance his people. Winsome is already aware that Art has crossed paths with some of their members. The Virtue clan is an anomaly even among the Usturas. He refers to them as scientists as they are constantly studying and furthering their insights into the workings of mana. When Agrona came into power, the Virtue's strength grew exponentially. However, it was later discovered that they had been experimenting on the bodies of the lesser races in Alacria, all in an effort to enhance their own abilities. One thing that Art still doesn't understand is how it's all related to him. Winsome uses his magic to forcefully revert Sylvie into her dragon form. He reveals that they had been searching for Sylvia for many years. However, when they finally found traces of her mana, they were shocked to see a little boy carrying a deity in his arms. He's shocked to his core when Winsome reveals that Art is now bonded with the child of his master's only daughter and the grandmother of the most powerful being on all three continents in the world. He still can't fathom the reality of the situation and sneaks a glance towards Sylvie. Winsome continues by telling him that most deities have three forms. He deduces that Sylvie is in her miniature beast form to converse energy, even though most Asuras tend to use their humanoid form for that purpose. Art is surprised to learn that Sylvie has a humanoid form. However, the deity informs him that if she still hasn't transformed into this form, then it's most likely that she isn't able to do so. This is probably because Sylvie's monocore is still underdeveloped, and this is very bad news for them. Since they have already found signs of Agronis spies in Decathan, he points out something that Art already knows by now, that there's soon going to be a war. Although the upper echelons of Ephiotis will never admit it out of pride, his connection to Sylvia will play a huge role in the upcoming war. Winsome reveals that he must become their ally, otherwise he will be separated from Sylvie. Art becomes infuriated upon hearing this, but he controls his anger. Since this war will involve Art's family and friends, they will be allies either way. But Art realizes that what Winsome is actually asking him is whether he will become their pawn or not. The deity is surprised at the depth of insight by this seemly young boy. He's also astonished by how well Art's monocore is developed. He adds that once they arrive in Ephiotis for further training, both he and Sylvie will become much stronger. Art is shocked to hear this. Winsome also informs Art that Sylvia's power that he carries within him is something that even the Asuras would kill for. But he has barely tapped into it. Ephiotis is the only place where he will be able to properly learn to harness it, and this is the only way Decathan will stand a chance against the mages of Alacria. Back at the Exiris Academy, the disciplinary committee is having a meeting. It has only been two days since Claire and Curtis have returned from the dungeon expedition, but they can't catch a second of rest because of all the hate crimes that have recently been going on on the campus. Kathleen has also been worried about her brother, 
who has been troubled since his return from the widow's crypt. The DC officers are on their own since the professors refuse to help until they get solid proof. Kai reveals that he has been able to catch a few people but nothing incriminating. Theo becomes extremely frustrated with their current circumstances. It seems their only option is to wait for Cynthia to return. This is all happening because a certain group is unhappy with how the school is progressing. Silence befalls the room as no one can find the words to say it. Kathleen's boiling anger finally comes to her eyes. It's revealed that the group has been using the excuse of Arthur being a professor despite his humble background. Ferith tries to calm her down and tells her that they all feel the same way. Their meeting is interrupted by Elijah. He intends to share something about art, but before he can begin speaking, they all hear a loud bang. The entire disciplinary committee rushes out to see what it is. While running, Kathleen is reminded of her mother. Equality was very important to the queen. Being young and naive, she refused to play with kids she deemed lower than her. However, it was her mother that taught her the importance of treating everyone equally. She taught her that before being a princess, she is a person. Everyone is different and special in their own way, but a person is a person. So she should never hate someone for things that can't change. The queen had fought hard for a building on campus to serve both as a museum and a monument to the alliance between the three races. This building was the Triunion Hall. Kathleen is shocked to see that the source of the sound is the hall. Many students and professors quickly gather to help rescue the students inside. The earth magic users among them form a stone wall to prevent the fire from spreading. Professor Glory also arrives soon after. She lets Torch carry the injured students to the hospital wing, while she stays behind to help with the rescue. A few professors form a team and use their water magic to try and put out the fire. They attempt to gather the flames to one side so they can be extinguished more easily. They succeed, but not before the building gets completely destroyed. Charles is among the students standing in the crowd. This is personal to Kathleen, so when she sees Charles, she becomes furious. In her anger, she loses control and goes to attack him. However, Theo manages to grab him before she can do so. He uses his gravity magic to pin him to the ground. The DC offices try to detain him. However, Charles starts playing the victim and begins screaming for help. Hearing his cries for help, one of the professors comes to see what's going on. The professor accuses the disciplinary committee of harassing students. Charles starts piling on and starts screaming about how he was just an innocent bystander when the DC officers suddenly attacked him out of nowhere. Theo gets very angry when Charles calls himself innocent. This is because he has already been seen multiple times with the radical group and now, he is also on the crime scene with his friends. The professor points out that it's only circumstantial evidence. Before the argument gets more heated, Professor Glory quickly steps in to stop them. Also, she sympathizes with Theo, informing him that he can't take in a student without evidence. Due to all this, the reputation of the disciplinary committee seems to have taken a hit, as the students start whispering about how the DC officers were about to attack an innocent student. Despite their frustration, they are forced to leave without doing much. While being carried away by his friends, Charles returns a cheeky grin towards the DC officers, confirming that it was probably him who started the attack on the Triunion Hall. Back at Art's private training room, Elijah is practicing his earth magic. However, he seems to be struggling. Despite his affinity to earth magic, his magic control is still weak. He still has a long way to go before he can become truly strong. He starts to become frustrated as he thinks about Art. After all, Art is a solid yellow quadra elemental mage with a dragon's will. However, that's not all. Despite all his strength, he has good friends who genuinely care for him. When Elijah told the disciplinary committee members that Art had safely returned from the widow's crypt, they were all truly happy and relieved. He wonders if they would have still been worried if they knew about his real strength. However, Elijah soon realizes that their concern doesn't stem from his abilities, but rather from their genuine friendship. He had initially thought that Art's popularity was solely due to his skill and power. But now he can't help but be a little jealous that Art has so many people who care for him. All sorts of questions start popping up in his mind as he thinks about how things could have been different if he hadn't been born among the dwarves. His mind becomes filled with hatred for Art as he thinks about the vision he had before. However, he manages to snap himself out of it and reminds himself that Art is his friend. He goes back to his training. He wants to get stronger so he can one day stand beside Art as his equal. On the other hand, Art seems to have finished his meeting with Winsome and is now waiting in line for the teleportation gate to Eleanor. However, he is not alone as many other merchants and traders have also been waiting for a while. Due to having the insignia of the royal family, he gets to cut in front of the line. 
One of the adventurers is not too pleased by this. He quickly runs forward and grabs Art by the shoulder. He gets frustrated and tells him to wait in line like everyone else. The maid escorting him informs the adventurer that Art is a guest of Eleanor and has urgent business to attend to. However, even before she can finish speaking, the adventurer shoves her aside and attacks the boy with his fire magic, threatening to burn him. In response, Art releases his own fire magic, which produces blue flames. The adventurer instantly realizes how outmatched he is and has no choice but to back off. After that little fiasco, Art continues heading to the teleportation gate along with the maid. He thinks back to his meeting with Winsome. He wanted to know why it took the Usuris so long to find him. Winsome highlights that it was because Art had concealed his insignia by using Sylvia's feather. This completely hid the presence of her signature. Now that they have finally found him, Winsome once again demands that he come to Ephiotis with him. In the present he has finally arrived at the royal palace. Once again, he is stopped by the royal guard as they demand some identification. He presents the compass once again, and as expected their tone instantly changes upon seeing it. Just when he is about to head in, they hear a loud boom. The royal guard quickly gets in front of Art to protect him, not knowing how strong he truly is. From this, he realizes that the royal guards aren't bad people, they're just a bit annoying. Virian emerges from the blast. Art is surprised to see him and wonders if he's fighting an intruder. However, Virian accurately observes that he wouldn't be having this much trouble if it was just another intruder. Before he could continue explaining, the source of the problem reveals itself. It seems to be Tessia who's having trouble controlling her new abilities. Virian reveals that she is already fully integrated with the Elderwood Guardian's beast will. Art is shocked to hear this as there is no way a normal person could integrate with an S-class beast in such a short time. But he soon discerns that it is related to the marble he received from Winsome. Even though she's awake and aware, Tessia can't control the vines, and they just keep multiplying every time Virian cuts one of them. So he tells Art to give it a shot. He agrees to do so and gets ready to attack. He dashes forward and quickly starts climbing the vines trying to reach Tessia. However, it soon becomes evident that it will be more difficult than he realized. He also can't use his fire magic among all these plants. It can cause the fire to spread and cause more damage than he intends to. Having no option, he decides to activate his beast will. He uses a move called Thunderclap Impulse. This allows him to greatly enhance his speed and quickly move between the vines. As he is about to reach her, he calls out and instructs her to prevent the vines from closing in. She uses all her willpower and manages to keep the vines from closing just long enough. Art is able to use this small window and manages to reach her just in time. As soon as he gets her away from the vines, they start to wither away. His beast will also runs out but not before he saves her. Tessia becomes frustrated at herself for always needing Art to come and rescue her. He tries to reassure her by telling her that it's not her fault. He blames himself for giving her the beast core in the first place. But Tessia is done being coddled. She lets him know that what he gave her was an opportunity to grow, and she intends to make sure of it to grow strong enough to stand by his side. He's happy to see her positive attitude. He gives her a fist bump and lets her know that he will be waiting. Unbeknownst to them, they are being watched by Winsome. He concludes that it's too soon to tell him everything. But one day, he will have to learn everything about Sylvie, especially the truth about her lineage. Art and Tessia's little moment is interrupted by Virian. He lets them know that they should think about the people who will have to clear this mess and head out. Art wonders where they are going but Virian decides not to reveal it for dramatic purposes and instead gives him a vague answer. Three of them, along with Sylvie, find themselves moving through the forest in a carriage. Virian blames himself for what happened earlier, since he was the one who encouraged Tessia to release the first phase of her beast will, since both of them thought that she could control it. At the very least, Virian believed that he would be able to handle it even if something did happen. Art realizes that since the integration phase was accelerated because of the marble, Tessia skipped the training phase and she never got the chance to test her control. Even now, he can feel that her beast will is different from his own. Even though it's fully integrated, it's still fighting back against her mana. He lectures Virian about how Tessia needs to be more careful. If this happens again, it would be dangerous not only for her, but for everyone around her as well. Virian gets frustrated and lets him have it, telling him that he was just a grandfather who got a little excited and proud over his granddaughter's progress. Getting back to the topic, he suggests that they could get a seal to suppress her mana until she learns better control. However, this would leave her completely defenseless if something were to happen and she couldn't remove the seal in time. So instead, he suggests that they get a protective artifact for her. 
Art agrees with this approach. He also teases Virian about how he can stay by his precious granddaughter's side if it makes him feel better. However, he is undeterred and suggests he can do that all he wants. Now that they have started talking about it, there is something Virian wants to know. He gets unexpectedly serious while asking Art about it. Putting all the teasing aside, he wants to know how Art truly feels about his granddaughter. He wants to know if he has ever thought about marrying her one day. Art is taken aback by this unexpected question. He lets Virian know that he does like Tessia, but right now, he can't say for certain that he knows what love actually means. He wants to improve himself before he can even think about asking for Tessia's hand in marriage. Virian is impressed by the boy's answer, and he's happy to see that his head is in the right place. Unbeknownst to the two of them, Tessia is actually awake and has been listening in on their conversation the whole time. She can barely contain herself after hearing that Art likes her and struggles to keep up the act. He is aware that the affection he feels for her is distinct from his feelings toward others. But right now, the best thing he can do is protect her. Having a protective artifact would be good for her. After all, he's definitely reassured knowing that his mother and Ellie have the Phoenix Pendant with them. Talking about all of this got him concerned about his family as well. He gets an idea that he should get Ellie a bond. This notion brings him a deep sense of satisfaction. It can safeguard her while also dissuading any potential admirers. The trio finally arrives at their destination. Art is surprised to see the king and queen here. They are delighted to meet him again and thank him for always protecting their daughter. They came here after they received the news that their manor is under construction, and they would like to know why that is. The king jokingly suggests that they must have finally destroyed it during one of their training sessions. However, they are left horrified to realize that that's actually what happened. Virian decides not to worry them with the truth and instead tells them that he was training with Tessia when he got a little excited and accidentally destroyed a part of the manor. He tells them that it will be fixed in no time, but they don't seem too reassured. He finally discloses the reason for their presence. They have come to meet Rinia. That reminds Tessia that they haven't met her in such a long time and wonders if she's all right. Virian tells her that she has been a little occupied. Rinia had told him a few times how interested she was in Art's future, and hence the reason for their visit. He grows curious about the reasons behind her interest. While moving through the forest, he starts to notice how much things have changed. The queen lets him know that none of them have met her ever since she moved. She chose to isolate herself from the kingdom for unknown reasons. Virian tried to visit her, but he ended up almost dying because of her traps. This is a concerning thing as this means that she has come to know about dangers lurking within the kingdom. The royal family, as well as Art, slowly make their way through the forest. Along the way, a few creatures make the mistake of running into Sylvie. One such creature is a mouse-like mana beast. Unfortunately for the little guy, he is too weak to escape Sylvie. She makes quick work of him by frying him up with her magic. As they walk, the king initiates a conversation with Art and realizes that he has never properly expressed his gratitude for the many times he and Sylvie have saved Tessia from dangerous situations. Art tells him that it's no big deal. In fact, she has helped him a lot as well. He informs the king that Tessia has kept him sane throughout all these difficult times. The king is surprised as he didn't expect a 13-year-old to be saying this. This would be more befitting coming from an old man. Then again, for some reason, the king has always felt that Art was more like an adult rather than a child. Art thanks him for his kind words. However, he clarifies that he didn't necessarily mean it as a compliment. Being a father himself, he realizes that no parent wants to see their child grow up too fast. They especially don't want them to bear the burdens that only an adult should bear. Although he is unaware of this, Art had already lost his youth long ago. He also tells the boy that it was because of him that the council was formed. Art begins to wonder what he means by this. The king explains that he didn't have a good impression of humans after the war. He even lost his mother because of them. He never found it in himself to forgive them. On top of that, his daughter was kidnapped by a bunch of human slave traders who trespassed into the elven forest. However, his perception changed when a human child brought his daughter back home safely. He had the courage to not only face the slave traders head-on, but also to chastise the elven king himself. Being lectured by a human child was the wake-up call that he needed. He wants to let Art know that he isn't opposed to bringing him into the family. Their conversation is heard by the whole group. Tessia couldn't be more embarrassed, while the queen uses this opportunity to tease her husband. Suddenly, their walk through the forest is halted as Durian feels a strange presence among them. The whole group quickly puts their guard up, ready to face any incoming attack. Art takes out his sword as well, 
Abruptly, a ghostly figure emerges from behind the bushes. This scares the pants off of Art, and he jumps forward to attack it without even realizing that it's Rinia. Virian manages to stop him just in time before he kills her. Rinia understandably gets very angry after having been nearly killed, despite coming all this way to ensure that they didn't get lost. Tessia becomes really happy to see her, and quickly goes over to give her a big hug. This immediately changes Rinia's mood. Now joined by her, the group continues their journey to her house. She is happy to see Art after all this time, and is even surprised by how handsome he has gotten. She even remarks that if she was a hundred years younger, she would have snatched him up for herself. However, he's unsure how he feels about that when he nearly peed himself after seeing her as a ghost. She lets him know how stunning she was as a young girl. Virian doesn't seem to think so and remarks that she was average at best. Rinia knows that he would say that as he only had eyes for one girl, she quickly realizes that she has stepped over the line with that comment and quickly apologizes to him. The rest of the royal family also seem to know what she is talking about, but Art and Tessia remain clueless. Virian apologizes, saying that he should be the one who is sorry since was aware of her feelings too. Putting aside that awkward conversation, Rinia signals everyone to continue moving forward. Art attempts to inquire about what they were discussing, but the queen interrupts him before he can begin speaking. After a long walk, the group finally arrives at a waterfall. This is where Rinia's home is. She presses a secret button on a boulder. This opens up a cave behind the waterfall. Before entering, she asks everyone not to conjure any light, and they will have to make their way through in the dark. After making their way through the darkened cave, they finally arrive at her house. They all enjoy a nice cup of tea while sitting beside the fireplace. Rinia's deviant magic allows her to make her house bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, much like what you see in Harry Potter. Art wonders what kind of magic allows her to do that. Something strange starts to happen as the group continues to sip down on the delicious tea. They slowly start to become woozy and eventually fall asleep. This happens to everyone except Art. However, he doesn't let it bother him and continues drinking his tea. Rinia becomes surprised that Art isn't more alarmed by this. He reveals that he has been in this situation a few times already so it's hard to be surprised anymore. It's obvious to him that she wants to tell him something that only he can know. He is right, but before she informs him that, she wants to clarify her powers as a diviner. He is surprised by this as he has never heard of such a magic user. Even the book at the Exiris Academy barely mentions such a form of deviant magic since it's so rare. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for him to learn about divination magic. Rinia begins the explanation by telling him about deviant magic. Deviants other than those who make use of the higher forms of basic elements have to find sources other than their mana core to fuel their magic. This is different from normal mages who use the mana particles in the surrounding environment. Alice is an example of a deviant magic user who doesn't use the higher form of basic elements. Her healing magic can't be categorized into the basic elements. Rinia has met many deviants in her lifetime, each with their unique deviant magic. One thing they all have in common is their own pool of mana. They draw upon it to power their magic. This is different from a normal deviant magic user such as Art. For diviners such as Rinia, their powers develop differently. They can awaken at any point in their lives and most of the time come in erratic bursts. They receive blurred images of the future in flashes. However, most of the time, they are too vague to make any accurate predictions. These flashes don't use their mana pool and happen randomly. It's not a very useful power if one can't control it. Art wonders about the spell she used to help him communicate with his parents all those years ago. She replies by telling him that it was one of her spells as a diviner that allowed her to project an image. True divination is about reading the future, knowing what and when something will happen before it takes place. Art becomes confused by all this. He wants to know how she is able to power her magic if she doesn't make use of her mana core. In a startling revelation, she discloses that she utilizes her lifespan. Every time she glimpses into the future, it reduces her own life expectancy. That is the true power of a diviner. She also decides to inform him about something that he has been longing to know. She tells him about Varian's wife and the previous queen of Eleanor. Her name was Lania. She was also a diviner, but her powers surpassed Rinia's by far. Her divinations and prophecies were significantly more extensive and detailed. They were also more frequent. This combined with her radiant beauty made her the most sought after in the entire kingdom. She held the envy and admiration of every female elf. Lania was the pride of the kingdom, and the citizens idolized her. 
After her encounter with Virian, the two quickly fell in love and got married in a beautiful ceremony. Everything seemed to be perfect for the two lovers. However, fate had other plans. The war between the humans and the elves was nearing its end. There was even talk about a peace treaty. However, tensions were still strong. The elves suspected that the humans wanted to make a show of their strength one last time, and they were right. The king of Sapin at the time wanted to carry out one final act of hostility against the future heir to the elven throne. This resulted in Virian being the target of an assassination. Lania was tormented by the vision of her husband's impending death. However, her prophecies didn't tell her how he was going to die. She tried everything to change the future. However, whenever she tried to intervene, she would only succeed in changing the cause of death. Virian could see the toll of his taking on his wife and begged her to stop. However, she couldn't leave her beloved to die, and so she continued to use her powers behind his back. Even just using her powers once, Rinya can feel the days, weeks, or even months that drain out of her body. But Lania used her powers daily, all to protect the one she loved. In the end, she was able to keep Virian alive long enough for the current king Glader to carry out a revolt against his father. He killed his father and managed to put an end to the war. Lania had finally succeeded, but she burned up most of her lifespan in the process. Hence, she died in Virian's arms only a few weeks after the war ended. Rinia hated Virian for a long time because of this. She also hated her sister for leaving her alone in this world, revealing that Lania was her sister. After hearing all this, Art is left shocked. Virian is so cheerful and loves joking around, so he never expected that he had such a tragic past. Sylvie is the first one to wake up and starts listening in on their conversation. Rinia makes it clear that she didn't tell him all this to garner sympathy. She told him this because she has used the same powers her sister used to look into Art's future. He's surprised by this revelation. He wonders why she specifically chose to use her powers on him. She reveals that she was getting glimpses of Art's future even before they met. Naturally, it's not very common to have so many visions of a specific person in a row. She warns him that Decathan is entering a new era. Things are quickly changing, and he seems to be at the center of all of this. Art's mind is filled with questions. He wonders why it's him. Rinia hesitates to tell him more, even though she knows the answer because of her powers of divination. Telling him too much can affect the outcomes that Art wants. At the same time, telling him too little would defeat the purpose of searching for a better outcome, which is the whole purpose of this meeting. Art becomes concerned that she is using up her lifespan while using her powers. He asks her if Virian knows this. She informs him that there is no need for him to know. She has lived long enough, and now she wants to help the future even if it comes at the cost of her lifespan. However, while trying to look into the future, it seems she has made some troublesome enemies. These enemies don't want her to help Art. This is also the reason why she decided to move to this remote hideout. Art becomes concerned for her, but she reassures him that it was her choice. She comes bearing bad news, but for now, all she can tell him is that he will face many hardships. This fact will remain constant no matter what path he chooses. He'll have to face many enemies and obstacles in his journey. Even though she can't tell him much, she decides to give him a small hint. She tells him that he needs an end goal. He needs to find out what he wants to accomplish in his life. This will determine his path. Before ending their conversation, she decides to give him two pieces of advice. Firstly, people do bad things with good intentions, so he shouldn't take everything at face value. And second, the most dangerous isn't necessarily the one who sits on the throne. Sometimes it's the abandoned soldier who has nothing to lose. She apologizes as she cannot disclose anything more without risking the future. Art becomes worried about whether he will be able to make the right choice or not. Rinia offers him solace and explains that sometimes the best choice may not necessarily be the right one. With this vague advice, they end their conversation and prepare to go to sleep for the night. Elsewhere in a jungle outside Xyrus Academy, Lucas along with three other members of the cult is carrying out a mission. Lucas has been given the same potion that was given to Marcois. Charles informs him that Marcois took it willingly, but his body couldn't handle it. In typical Lucas fashion, he makes fun of Charles and the other two members for not getting selected to take the potion. Lucas knows the reason behind this. It's because their mana core is weaker than his. If they were to take the potion, they would die the moment it entered their bodies. Charles gets angry at Lucas for wasting time and asks him to hurry up. As always, he doesn't take kindly to anyone telling him what to do. He instantly attacks Charles with his fire magic. He reminds him to stay in his place as he is only a messenger boy. Lucas finally decides to take the potion and gulps it down in one go. He instantly starts feeling the effects. 
he feels intense pain and is forced to get on his knees. The three members take delight in his suffering and start making fun of him for being weak. Thinking he is about to die, Charles even goes as far as to step on his face. This is a mistake he will soon come to regret. Shortly after, Lucas recovers from his pain and grabs Charles' leg. He uses a powerful fire magic to completely burn him. He finishes his attack by sending him flying through the air towards a tree. He is dumbfounded upon seeing his new powers. At this moment, he is reminded of the conversation he had with his brother in the hallway. His brother harshly lectured him about relying on their parents' money to grow stronger while not making any effort himself. Now that he has this power, he can show them all how strong he is. These are the thoughts that enter his mind as he transforms into something akin to a monster. Realizing the danger they are in, one of the members tries to make a run for it. His attempt fails horribly as Lucas is easily able to attack him from behind with his fire magic. The member is roasted alive, to the point where only his ashes remain. Seeing this, the other member becomes furious and tries to attack Lucas with her water magic. However, her magic doesn't even compare to the level where Lucas is at. Her water bullets instantly evaporate due to the intense heat that he's producing. He lunges at her, seizes her by the throat, and using his momentum, smashes her against the ground. The intense heat starts to burn her alive. With her completely burnt throat, she can't even find the words to beg for her life. Lucas finishes her off as well and proceeds to the last remaining member. Seeing how brutally the others were killed, Charles can do nothing but cower beside the tree. He can do nothing as Lucas slowly reaches his hand out towards him, intending to kill him. We can only imagine the horrible way he met his end as well. It's the next day and the Elden family has finally awoken from their peaceful slumber. They seem refreshed after a nice long nap. This was long overdue for the overworked family. Rinia apologizes for putting the calming herbs in their tea. She makes up the excuse that she didn't think that it would knock them out. Alduin tells her that it's alright since they needed it anyway. Virion, on the other hand, isn't too happy about it. His long nap made him miss all the urgent business he needed to take care of. Rinia tries to tease him by telling him that his only urgent business is dealing with the mess he made of the royal palace. However, Virion quickly shuts her up with a broccoli. Putting that aside, Rinia brings out a gift she had prepared for Tessia. She already knew that Tessia needed something to help her with her beast will, so she prepared something in advance. It's an artifact that can seal the user's mana. This is exactly what Art and Virion were talking about. Art is surprised that she already knew. However, this is something very normal for the royal family by now, after having known Rinia for so long. Alduin thanks Rinia for always looking out for his daughter. She assures him that it's no big deal and suggests that they should enjoy the evening, as Art and Tessia will be leaving for Xura City soon. After having a wonderful time at Rinia's house, it's finally time to leave. She takes everyone to a teleportation gate, not far from her house. Teleportation gates have been around since ancient times and are under tight regulation by the kingdom. But I guess one can get away with a lot of things when they are friends with the royal family. Tessia hugs her parents goodbye. She also gives a long hug to Rinia. After the goodbyes are over, they make their way through the teleportation gate and arrive in Exira City. Tessia is surprised to see the lack of guards. However, Art tells her that it's probably because of the Aurora Constellate. She's also mesmerized by the beautiful night sky. No matter how many times she sees it, she still can't help but be amazed. The two of them arrive at Helstie's mansion to visit Art's family. Upon their arrival, Art is pleasantly surprised by the unexpected guests. It's none other than Jasmine and the rest of the Twin Horn members. Despite all this time, they are still as goofy as always. I guess some things never change, but Art couldn't be happier seeing them like this. Speaking of things not changing, he gets the same greeting from Angela as he did when he was a kid. Tessia also gets some of her love. Ray, Alice, and Ellie also come out to meet their son. Now that everyone is here, they decide to go in to celebrate. However, before they could head in, Tessia lets everyone know that she needs to get going. She only came to say hello, and besides she needs to catch up on her work as the student council president and meet Cynthia as well. Art worries that there might be something wrong, but she reassures him that she just simply wants Cynthia's help to adjust her new artifact. Art realizes that he shouldn't leave her alone since she can't use most of her magic right now. However, she insists that she will be fine, so he agrees to let her go. After bidding farewell to everyone, she sets off for Xyrus Academy. Back at the house, the adults start drinking and celebrating. However, soon things take a turn for the worse. But it is to be expected when a bunch of adults start drinking with no regard for restraint. Helen asks him if he would like to head out for some fresh air. 
Art quickly jumps at the opportunity to escape this weirdness. She tells him that he is meant for bigger things. All he needs to do is stay anchored and find what he is fighting for. He instantly realizes that these are the same words that Rinia told him. Considering her divination abilities, it can't be a coincidence. Art decides not to bring that up and continues the conversation. After a wholesome chat, Helen decides to head back in. He can't help but think about what she told him. Although he doesn't know why he was brought into this world, he refuses to believe that it was only to be a pawn in someone else's game. Protecting the smiles and laughter of the people he cherishes, that's the fate he wants to make. Back at the underground cave, the cult members are preparing for their attack on the Exiris Academy. Using a teleportation portal, the leader summons a massive army of abnormal mana beasts. The DC members are busy preparing a barrier. They are already aware that the cultists could launch an all-out attack at any time. Hence, they are preparing by putting up a protective barrier. Kai is the one setting up the barrier while everyone else warms up. Dordry seems to be the only one missing. The training freak arrives soon after with a bunch of mana resistance bands. However, she takes a nasty tumble as soon as she enters the room. Curtis suggests that they shouldn't be wasting their mana just before the start of a potential battle. However, Claire reminds him that she means well. Now that they are all here, Theo tells Kai to activate the barrier. The barrier gets activated with everyone inside except for Kai. They soon realize that there is something wrong as the barrier is red. On top of that, they are unable to leave and seem to be trapped. Curtis tells Kai to turn the barrier off, not realizing that they have been betrayed. Even Farrah thinks that it's all a joke, however, they don't get any response from him. They still don't want to consider that possibility and think that maybe he can't hear them because of the barrier. Theo tries to smash through the barrier, but it obviously doesn't work. Kathleen tells everyone to stop wasting mana and reminds them that there is an emergency kill switch that they can use to deactivate the barrier from the inside. It shouldn't be much of a shock as the kill switch has already been broken. The DC officers finally realize the gravity of the situation. The situation takes a turn for the worse as they find themselves facing an all-out attack by the cultists. The DC officers quickly get into formation and prepare themselves to counter the incoming assault. They prove their worth as DC officers by slowly taking out the cultists. Surprisingly, they still haven't caught on to Kai's betrayal as Claire orders everyone to slowly start moving forward so they can help Kai. However, their momentum comes to a screeching halt with the arrival of Lucas. He finally breaks the news about how it was Kai who trapped them inside in the first place. Even when faced with reality, they are unable to accept it due to their blind trust in their friend. Lucas, on the other hand, doesn't care what they want to believe and starts his attack on the DC officers. He dashes in and launches a powerful attack, sending everyone flying. Claire tries to attack him from behind but is nearly taken out by Lucas's spell. She is saved just in time by Dordria. In a stroke of luck, Claire spots one of the mana resistance bands that Dordria brought in earlier. It seems to have interfered with the barrier formation, creating an opening through which they can escape. Claire relays this to Dordria. If they can gather everyone at that spot, they can escape before Lucas has a chance to stop them. However, this is easier said than done as Lucas's magic is on a completely different level right now. Despite Theo using his best magic against him, he remains unfazed and grabs him by the throat. Just when it seems like the worst is about to happen to Theo, he is saved by another stroke of luck. As Lucas gets an alert on his communication device, it informs him of Tessia's arrival. Excited by this, he leaves to grab Tessio while the rest of the cultists deal with the DC officers. Now that Lucas is gone, the DC officers have the perfect opportunity to escape. Realizing this, Claire orders everyone to use defensive spells so they can get out. Following her order, everyone launches their most powerful defensive spells to hold back the cultists. It works and they are able to create an opening big enough for them to escape. However, the cultists don't back down and try to chase after them. Realizing this, Dordria decides to stay back to ensure that her comrades make it out safely. However, she finds herself outmatched by the enemy. Just as she is about to be taken out, she is saved by Ferrith. It seems he didn't want to leave a friend behind, so he decided to stay as well. Now the two of them find themselves against an entire army. The rest of the DC officers manage to escape and try to quickly make their way out of the building. They hope to find a professor so they can help their friends. However, upon exiting the building, they are left completely horrified. The entire campus is under attack by the abnormal mana beasts. Elsewhere, Tessia is making her way to the Exiris Academy in her carriage. She didn't want to worry Art, 
but she feels like her body is out of sync right now. Her manicure is completely exhausted. She is going to the academy with the hope that Cynthia can help her figure this out. However, her chain of thought is interrupted by a sudden stop. They have arrived at the academy, but it seems to be completely sealed off because of the barrier. Before she could try and head back, her carriage along with the driver get blown away by a powerful fire attack. Only one person can produce such powerful fire magic, and as expected it's none other than Lucas. Tessia is shocked to see him. He, on the other hand, couldn't be happier to see her all alone and defenseless. It's finally time for him to get his revenge. Lucas begins to burn the driver alive. Even in her weakened state, Tessia tries to put out the flames in order to rescue him. However, her efforts are in vain as Lucas finishes him off with a powerful fire attack. He tells her to worry about herself instead of a lowly commoner. This gets her enraged, and she begins attacking him. Due to her strength, her attacks seem to be somewhat effective. However, because of the ceiling bracelet, she's unable to use all her strength. Lucas realizes this and boldly walks forward while Tessia is barely able to stay focused. Although Rinia's bracelet is keeping her beast will in check, it is also limiting her use of magic. Lucas grabs her and lifts her off the ground. He remarks that maybe she will like him better than Art. However, from this Tessia is instantly able to deduce what Lucas's plan is. She realizes that the fact that he is not killing her means that she is not the intended target. Using the same drug as Marcois, tracking her down, she realizes that all this could mean one thing, that he is after Art. Lucas gets angry and smashes her into the ground. However, Tessia is undeterred. She goes on about how he has an inferiority complex. However, she only succeeds in growing Lucas's rage, and he continues attacking her. He warns her against using her snarky comments, telling her that keeping her alive doesn't necessarily mean that she will be in one piece. She is once again unfazed. She has realized how hopeless her situation is and hence decides to take extreme measures. She takes off Rinia's bracelet and lets her beast will go wild. Lucas is caught off guard and she manages to grab hold of him using her vines. She doesn't want to get Art in trouble, so she wants to hold on as long as possible without being captured. However, her desperate effort fails to work against Lucas's powerful magic. He's able to burn all the vines with one burst of his fire magic. This also knocks her unconscious. Lucas grabs the bracelet and puts it back on her. This way he can be sure that she won't use the same crazy magic again. He grabs the nearly conscious Tessia by the hair and begins dragging her into the barrier. She is unable to move her body and can only watch helplessly as the mana beasts rip apart the students right in front of her. Elijah is also among the students trapped within the barrier. He uses his earth magic to protect the students whenever he can. However, there is only so much one person can do by themselves. The cultists announce to all the human students to surrender themselves and swear their allegiance. If they do so, then they ensure that they will not be attacked by the mana beasts. Elves and dwarves are not given this privilege. All they can do is quietly stand aside while their mana core is completely destroyed. All Elijah can do is sneak around and try to find help. However, luck is not on his side as even some of the professors are part of the cult. He can do little against someone as strong as a professor. He is rescued just in time by Grotter. Seeing Elijah and Curtis fighting together, the professor has no option but to flee. Curtis quickly instructs the student to make her way to the training facility. There are still some good professors who can help them. Elijah asks him about the rest of the DC officers. He is particularly concerned about Art and Tessia. He is relieved when Curtis informs him that they are not on campus. Little do they know the reality of the situation. Their conversation is interrupted by a screeching noise. It's the same static you hear from a microphone. The leader of the cultist has finally arrived. He makes his way to the center of the academy while carrying a bloody bag with him. With one look it's obvious what the bag contains. He tells everyone to pay attention as this is not something they would want to miss.